Good morning, and thank you for joining today's congressional briefing on electrification and transportation. Our conversation is part of the ICCF Group's Energies and Forest Program, through which we convene members of Congress, administration officials, and key stakeholders in driving bipartisan consensus within conservation and climate. ICCF serves as an informal secretariat to the leadership of several important caucuses here in the US and across the globe, including the House and Senate International Conservation Caucuses and the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. To learn more, please go to our website, internationalconservation.org. I'm Chrissy Harbin, our Capitol Hill Program Director. Last night's cloture vote on the bipartisan infrastructure plan in the Senate provides an important backdrop for our conversation with 17 Republicans joining 50 Democrats and independents and agreeing to move forward to consider the package. Certainly a lot of hard work remains over the details and we have a long way to go before a final passage vote, but we're encouraged to see the ongoing willingness of the administration and Senate Democrats to work with Senate Republicans in negotiating a bipartisan agreement. Reducing emissions in the transportation sector is a significant effort that requires the partnership of a diversity of stakeholders. State and federal government policymakers, international allies, private industry, and technology researchers each have a role to play. I'm delighted that we have representatives from each of these important communities with us today. Our program has three parts. First, we're pleased to show pre recorded comments uh, by Congressman Bill Foster, Democratic Congressman representing the 11th District of Illinois. Second, we're thrilled to welcome Mr. Spite Young Rotevatten, the climate minister of the government of Norway back to our program. He'll share insights about the efforts that Norway has made in electrifying its fleet. Third, we'll convene a conversation with experts from industry and the research community. We have representatives from Argonne National Laboratory, Volkswagen of America, Mazda, and Kia. We look forward to hearing their perspectives and learning about their efforts. For those who are joining us live via Zoom, please feel free to use our chat box to answer any questions that you would like to pose during our conversation. We'll pull questions from this chat box uh, into our, our uh, discussion later. Many thanks to everyone for participating. To begin, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Congressman Bill Foster. As a PhD scientist, as, an, as a member of the House Science Committee, he plays a key role in advancing technology innovation in Congress. He's a consistent champion of science and the national labs, including Argonne National Laboratory, which is in his, his district, and we'll hear from one of their experts uh, towards the end of our program. As evidence of his willingness to work across party lines, Congressman Foster sponsored the BEST Act in the House, bipartisan legislation that supports developing energy storage technology at the U US Department of Energy. Congress included this bill in the coronavirus and relief and omnibus package that passed this past December. Congressman Foster had a competing priority this morning, but we are grateful that he made time for us and sent pre-recorded remarks uh, for our program, which we are grateful to show now. I'm Congressman Bill Foster, and I'm proud to represent the 11th District of Illinois and the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, thank you all for joining today's congressional briefing on electrification and tra transportation. And thank you to the International Conservation Caucus Foundation for inviting me to kick off today's conversation. You know, I sometimes introduce myself as saying that I represent 100% of the strategic reserve of PhD physicists in the US Congress, because for 23 years before I was in Congress, I was a high energy particle physicist at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois, where we designed and built giant particle accelerators and detectors that were used to discover the long predicted top quark, the heaviest known form of matter, which was discovered exactly as predicted, although at a mysteriously high mass that remains a mystery today. But along the way to build these state-of-the-art projects, I designed analog and digital computer chips, built superconducting magnets, and worked in many other state-of-the-art technologies. I, so I may be the only member of Congress who's designed and built a 100,000 ampere superconducting power transmission line and the 100,000 ampere power supply to drive it, and perhaps the only member of Congress who has won an energy savings award from the U.S. Department of Energy uh, for one of my inventions in particle accelerator magnets. 
But before I worked in science, I was a businessman. When I was 19, my younger brother and I started a company in our basement with $500 from my parents with the idea of using a, a newly invented microprocessor to control theater lights. And that company now manufactures over half of all of the theater lighting equipment in North America and provides over 1,500 well-paying manufacturing jobs in the Midwest, which is something I'm very proud of. So when I came to Congress, I brought my commitment to research and development, especially within our national labs with me. But I also understand that the realities of commercial feasibility matter just as much as wishful thinking or political messaging. So I'm incredibly excited for what a public-private research partnership will mean for electrification and transportation. Our fight against the climate crisis will entail technological advancements and improvements and the process of trial and error that accompanies such progress. And our government has a carefully chosen role to play. Uh, when I was had just entered Congress about a decade ago, Congress made, uh, and the US government made two interesting bets uh, in electric cars and in solar power. Uh, it, you know, it was known ever since uh, before I was an undergraduate that in principle, electric cars were cheaper except for the battery. And, uh, and similarly, it has been known forever, or at least since the 1950s, that the raw materials in solar energy in solar cells was, in principle, incredibly cheap. There is no shortage of silicon. Um, but the economics have always been, uh, you know, the devil's detail. Uh, and so back about 10 years ago, the United States Department of Energy uh, put some money, uh, several hundred million dollars, in a couple of speculative startups. The first one was called Solyndra, a solar energy uh, startup uh, whose technology did not pan out as commercially, it, it worked, but it did not pan out as, as being commercially competitive. Um, and it ended up going bankrupt and with a $300 million loss to the taxpayer. We also put um, several hundred, I think probably about $500 million into this electric car startup by the name of Tesla. And that uh, to basically uh, fund Elon Musk to build his first factory. And uh, so that $500 million investment has now grown into a company with market capitalization. Last time I looked, uh, significantly over $500 billion. And the federal taxpayer has gotten that, uh, you know, that investment many times over returned through capital gains taxes alone. And so a well-chosen investment program that can be good for business and good for, um, you know, for the taxpayer. Uh, and, and those investments must continue. We're on the frontier of technology that will transform our energy grid and our infrastructure and, uh, and continuing improvements to electric vehicle technology. And I'm grateful that we now have a new administration in the White House that under President Biden's leadership, we will reduce emissions and upgrade our nation's infrastructure and EV technology and continued improvements uh, to the economics and performance of EV technology will be a critical component in meeting those goals. Uh, technological advancement that improves the lives of Americans it should not be a partisan issue. And it's gonna take all of us together to move those vital initiatives forward. And one of those are the challenges of putting renewable energy sources onto the grid. Uh, which gets increasingly difficult and less economical as the fraction of intermittent and seasonal energy sources are added. When you add, when you start adding intermittent renewables to the grid, uh, you need standby generation capacity that's economically wasteful, or you need batteries or other energy storage. And the first batteries you buy when you add renewables to the grid uh, help you solve the day-night problem in intermittent storage. They're charged and discharged every day. So you recoup the cost of those batteries pretty quickly. But as you increase the fraction of renewables, the last batteries that you buy are solving the summer winter problem. So they are only charged and discharged once a year. And it is very difficult to recoup the cost of those batteries unless the long-term storage is very cheap and very efficient. And that's why I'm proud that last year, my bipartisan Better Energy Storage Technology, or BEST Act, passed Congress and was signed into law. This legislation sets forth a cross-cutting program at the Department of Energy 
to advance a suite of grid storage technologies. It directs DOE to establish a research and development program that coordinates across relevant program offices to make progress toward developing cost-effective and sustainable energy storage systems, including testing and validation activities. It also directs the department to develop a five-year strategic plan to continue to identify and refine research goals of the program. And finally, it authorizes an energy storage demonstration program, as well as a technical assistance program to help put more energy storage systems onto the electric grid. I think this is the kind of initiative that we should all be able to get behind. And I am looking forward to building on this progress so the United States remains in the best possible position to lead the world in the development of grid storage technology. Now, one of the exciting developments under the Biden administration is the department's new energy earth shots initiatives. The first earth shot, the hydrogen shot, sets a target to accelerate innovations and spur demand for clean hydrogen by reducing the cost by 80%. The second, the long duration storage shot, aims to reduce the cost of grid scale, scale energy storage by 90% for systems that deliver more than 10 hours of duration storage and to do that cost reduction within the decade. These earth shots match the spirit of the BEST Act and they will drive the major innovation breakthroughs that we know must be achieved to solve the climate crisis. A lot of cross-cutting research in this field is being done at Argonne National Laboratories, which I'm proud to represent as part of the 11th District of Illinois. Argonne and all of our national labs are such a vital resource, not just for our country, but for the entire world. The Department of Energy and National Laboratories have more than pulled their weight on initiatives, you know, such as the development of the technology necessary to deal with climate change and numerous other key technologies that we depend on every day. The estimates are that roughly half of all economic growth since World War II is because of the results of scientific research and technology. And the national labs have led the way not only in developing these breakthrough technologies, but also in helping commercialize them. And that's why I recently introduced the Restore and Modernize Our National Laboratories Act of 2021, uh, just last week. Uh, this bill would authorize Congress to appropriate six, uh, $6.1 billion each year for the next five years. The funds would be used by the department for priority maintenance projects at the labs and the sustainment and upgrade of lab infrastructure and facilities. This funding would also support lab modernization programs and the promotion of environmentally friendly and responsible operations. And I want to take a moment to highlight the cutting edge research and electric storage near my home district in Illinois. Researchers at Argonne National Lab are working hard to accelerate the state of advanced batteries, including leading the development of no novel cathode, anode, and electrolyte designs, as well as new material synthesis and the characterization of, of these devices, tools for the characterization of them. And in particular, Argonne National Lab is the home of the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, uh, also known as JCSER. Uh, which is a $24 million annual investment made by DOE to develop transformative battery storage technologies that go beyond lithium ion batteries. I'm sure that Dr. Walner will elaborate on some of this work in today's conversation. And my goal is to is that the restore and modernize our national laboratory acts will help support efforts just like these. In the United States Congress, I'll be continuing to fight for sustained and expanded federal funding for scientific research, uh, for public-private research partnerships and opportunities to fuel innovation for electrification and transportation. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of today's program. Wonderful. Many thanks to Congressman Foster for his comments and for his leadership. I appreciate the DNA, DNA helix pattern in this necktie. I think it's a good illustration of his commitment to advancing sound science on Capitol Hill. Next, I'd like to turn to our keynote speaker, the Minister of Climate and Environment for the Government of Norway, Mr. Sveitjung Rotevbon. He serves as the Minister of Climate and the Environment, and he's also the first deputy leader of the Liberal Party in Norway. 
He previously served as a state secretary at the same department before becoming minister, so he has certainly played a major role in shaping Norwegian climate policy for the present and the future. Elon Musk tweeted earlier this week that Norway has played a major role in supporting the advent of electric vehicles, and the numbers certainly back him up. Norway has been very successful in getting electric cars on the road. And the share of electric cars and new passenger car registrations exceeded 64% last month in Norway, which is up from 43% one year ago. In total, over 80% of all new passenger cars in Norway from January to June of this year had an external charging connection, while pure petrol and diesel cars only achieved a share of 5% each. Impressive numbers. Mr. Minister, thank you for sharing your time and insights this morning. Thanks for being back with us. I invite you to share your perspective on Norway's efforts in driving the adoption of electric vehicles. Well, thank you. And uh, it's good to be back. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you guys about uh, the Norwegian electric vehicles story. Um, of course, uh, you know, every country is different. and. Um, our story uh, couldn't simply be replicated into any other country. Uh, yet I think there are some elements here that could and should be considered by all countries as I believe they have been successful. Uh, now, of course, uh, as you probably know, Norway is a rather small country. We uh, have uh, 5.4 million people living here now. Uh, and of course, that means we don't have that many cars either, around 3 million passenger cars in total. Uh, and we sell around 150,000 new passenger uh, vehicles every year. Uh, at the same time, Norway is a rather large country geographically. Uh, we have a coastline longer than the west coast of the US. And uh, though a large share of our population lives in, in urban areas, uh, we take pride in ensuring that our small towns all over the country are thriving and that our vast uh, nature is accessible. So. Um, you wouldn't really think that electric vehicles would be an obvious choice for a thinly populated large country with uh, very cold winters. Yet almost six out of 10 every new cars sold in Norway are battery electric vehicles. Two out of 10 are plug-in hybrids and only one out of 10 new cars is not battery driven somehow. So how did we get there? Well. We are working to achieve our targets, uh, and our current target is that by 2025, all new cars in, uh, sold in Norway should be zero emission vehicles. Over the years, the Norwegian government has put in place a broad number of incentives uh, to purchase electric vehicles, uh, to use electric vehicles, and to build charging infrastructure. One of the main pillars of this policy and of our climate policy in general is putting a price on emissions. We've had a carbon tax in place since 1991, uh, and over 80% of all emissions in Norway are somehow subject to a carbon price, either through our national carbon tax or through the European emission trading system. And Norwegian subsidy schemes are designed to promote technology development or solving specific market barriers working together with emission pricing. Cars in Norway are subject to a purchasing tax, which is based partly on CO2 emissions. Electric cars are, however, exempt from the purchasing tax, uh, and they're also exempt from our general sales tax. And that in total provides a strong financial incentive to buy electric vehicles. Also, the fuel, gasoline and diesel, uh, is subject to a carbon tax in Norway. Uh, our electricity production is almost exclusively renewable, and electricity is much cheaper than gasoline and diesel. So uh, electric cars have a number of user benefits. Uh, in addition to the ones I've already mentioned, they uh, get cheaper road tolls get access to bus lanes, uh, reduced public parking fees, etc. So uh, the total package designed to promote battery electric vehicles has been quite powerful and it's worked quite well. Large scale electri electrification also requires charging infrastructure, both at home and on the road. Our building codes in Norway, they require that new buildings are built uh, charge ready 
Uh, we've also created a mechanism for cost sharing when installing charging infrastructure in existing apartment buildings. Uh, but fast charging infrastructure is also necessary. Uh, and this is uh, somewhat of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, because before enough electric vehicles are on the road, it's not profitable to build fast charging stations. But without the charging stations, you uh, will struggle to get enough electric vehicles on the road. So how do you do that? Well, uh, over many years, we've sought to uh, use market forces primarily to get this uh, thing on the road, uh, so to speak. Um, but in 2015 and in 2016, uh, we used an open tendering process where public funds ensured construction of two charging stations every 50 kilometer along the main transport corridors in the country. Uh, that allowed electric vehicles with even the shortest range to travel from the south to the north of the country, uh, while also allowing market forces to work. Every new fast charging station along these highways has been a purely commercial investment uh, and numerous different companies have been involved. But still, there were many areas beyond the main transport corridors that lacked fast chargers. And the government then decided to support uh, construction of up to two chargers in every municipality that didn't have one. Today, we have over 3,000 fast chargers in the country. Um, some of them have received uh, government support, as I mentioned, around 500 of them have received some sort of support. But that also means that 2,500 of them have been purely commercial investments. So the market is developing and the numbers are increasing now rapidly. So why do we support electric cars in the first place? I actually didn't uh, say anything about that. So I should probably mention a few points. Um, well. Uh, in Norway, as I said, almost all of our power generation is based on renewables and heating in buildings is based on electricity. Uh, what that means is that for us to reduce our climate emissions, uh, the transport sector is key uh, because we have ambitious climate targets. We need to reach them and we can't merely reach them by uh, closing down coal-fired power plants and build uh, hydroelectric power plants because we already did that. So the transport sector is where things need to happen. And uh, electrical cars have several benefits for society. Uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions over the lifetime, lower air pollution, less noise. But though those should be valid and good arguments to buy an electric vehicle, people always and also think about their, uh, about their uh, purse, about their family's economy. Uh, and rightfully so. So uh, people in Norway use electric cars because it's convenient, but also because it's profitable for them. Our many policies have a common objective, which is to make EVs economically uh, attractive and viable and a good option to conventional combustion engine cars. Now, uh, all these incentives obviously come with a cost. However, the reason that we've been able to introduce them in the first place is that we tax conventional cars uh, fairly highly. If we didn't have special uh, taxes on cars, if we didn't have a, a rather high sales tax, if we didn't have carbon taxes on fuel, this would all be much more difficult. But we do have those taxes in place. And that means that you don't have to subsidize the battery electric vehicles directly. Uh, you simply have to accept them from the taxes that apply to fossil fuel cars. So that has been a, a substantial incentive. It still costs the government money in terms of loss of revenue, uh, but uh, that is a price that we have been willing to pay. Now, our focus on electric mobility is not just about cars. Uh, we also have targets for zero emission vans uh, and city buses by 2025. By 2030, all heavy vans, 50% of new trucks and 75% of new long distance buses are supposed to be zero emission. And to achieve those goals, we have a number of targeted investment support uh, in place. Each of these three categories uh, are progressing. Over the last two years, electric vans have gone from almost non-existent to over 20% of new sales. Heavy vehicles, such as trucks, are also on their way in with several manufacturers offering smaller series of vehicles. Electric buses have now become quite common in Norwegian cities and most large 
public transportation companies are now including uh, electric buses in their tenders. Electric construction machinery is also increasing in later years, such as excavators. Uh, this allows public procurement requirements of zero emission construction sites, where we've seen, for example, our capital city of Oslo uh, take the lead. Uh, finally, I should mention that uh, as a coastal nation uh, with a strong coastal history and maritime history, green shipping is a priority for Norway. Batteries are being installed in all types of marine vessels. This year, we have more than 70 electric and hybrid ferries in operation on the Norwegian coast. And we've seen several examples of hybrid oil tankers and passenger ships. One autonomous electric container ship is being built for short sea shipping. And another autonomous ferry will transport cargo across the Oslo Fjord. And inhabitants in our capital can even participate in an electric boat sharing scheme for day trips on the fjord. Uh, in total, I think of all the vessels in the world that have some sort of battery uh, installed, 40% are Norwegian. Norway has strengthened our climate target to at least 50%, up to 55% emission reductions by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. We must make sure that it pays to cut greenhouse gas emissions to reach our climate targets and at the same time create green growth. So climate policy is simply the way we transform Norway and equip our country for the future. We think that is a sound investment, not only for our environment, but also for our business community uh, and the health and air of our cities. So I think we're on the right track. Still a lot of work to be done, uh, but we've seen uh, what works and we'll build on that heading into the future. Thank you. Thank you. That's it's fascinating to learn more about um, the incentives that your, your country has, has put in place uh, to encourage adoption of electric cars, how you're thinking about this really comprehensively um, and the electrification of different parts of the of the transportation sector and how this uh, matches up with um, your climate goals. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, we did receive uh, two questions. Uh, from folks, let me draw from them. Uh, oh, one was just answered. Thank you very much. You anticipated it. Uh, we got a question about your uh, targets for commercial vehicles, but very happy that you addressed them in your comments. I have one more question for you uh, while we have you. I recall uh, earlier this year um, during the Super Bowl, there was a really entertaining ad highlighting Norway's efforts. Uh, I loved it. Will Farrell learns that Norway is leading the charge in adopting EVs, uh, grabs a microphone, and then uh, travels across the Atlantic to give you an earful. Uh, what was the response in, in Norway? How did this ad go over? <laughs> well, uh, the response was uh, very enthusiastic uh, and got wide coverage in Norwegian uh, media uh, because I think Norwegians are actually quite proud of what we have achieved uh, when it comes to battery electric vehicles. And obviously a number of Norwegians drive battery electric vehicles and are happy with them. And I think, uh, you know how it is in any country when, when someone else sees what you're doing and uh, applauding it, that's uh, something to take pride in. Uh, and I should add that Will Ferrell is kind of on a European role in that regard, seeing that he uh, made that a uh, Eurovision movie uh, that was, uh, uh, put on Netflix uh, last year, I think, which was also very popular in Europe at large and, uh, of course, in Norway. So um, uh, that was a proud moment for my country. Good, good. Well, we're proud of uh, two of our exports, uh, Will Ferrell and electric vehicles. So happy to partner with you on both. <laughs> well, good. Well, thank you very much for your comments today. Uh, really enjoy learning from you uh, and your experience in, in um, this issue and many others. So thank you very much for being with us today. Great to partner with you. Thank you. Next, I would like to move to our expert panel. Uh, we have a really great uh, lineup of folks who have significant expertise in um, this important area. We have, um, as we heard from Congressman Foster in the beginning of our program, Argonne National Laboratory in Illinois is leading much of the advanced work in battery storage technology. That's why we're really grateful to have a lead research for, researcher from Argonne on our panel. Dr. Thomas Walner is the manager of the Advanced Mobility and Grid Integration Technology Research Section in Argonne Center for Transportation Research. He and his team 
uh, focus on the experimental evaluation and analysis of advanced vehicle technologies. We also have Dustin Krause. He is the director of e-mobility North America for Volkswagen of America, and he's worked in the electric vehicle space for over 12 years. His background is on sales and marketing, as well as market expansion and remarketing for EVs. Dustin spent nine years with Tesla in a variety of roles previous to joining Volkswagen. Uh, now he's currently working to shape VW's push to e-mobility, leading the focus on product improvements and improving the customer experience. We also are thrilled to have Dan Ryan. He serves as vice president for government and public affairs at Mazda. Dan has been with Mazda since 2001, so surely he's seen a lot of this uh, these changes uh, in electrification firsthand, um, and he's been involved in many significant efforts from the company. And last but not least, we also have Amadi Muskis. She's the senior manager of government affairs at Kia. She has over 15 years of experience in advancing the agenda of smart and green mobility and innovation and transportation in the US, as well as in the EU. Uh, she has been instrumental in influencing US state and federal policy um, in, here in the US and the EU. So before we dive into q and would I'm eager to get this group's reactions on the remarks we heard today from Congressman Foster and Minister Roltevan, uh, and your top, as well as your top line thoughts on this topic. So uh, Dustin, would you like to begin? Yeah, sure. So uh, kind of serendipitous for me, I grew up in, in the district of, um, of, of Congressman Foster. Congressman Foster. Uh, I spent uh, field trips going to Argonne National Labs and Fermilab. So, uh, you know, it's one of the big reasons that I really got into this space. So uh, I think uh, just really inspiring to see someone so focused on um, I'm pushing this technology and sound science uh, in Congress is great. And the other thing in Norway, uh, spent many years uh, uh, overseas. Uh, I actually lived in, in Amsterdam and uh, worked in the, in the Nordics quite a bit. Uh, of course, seeing uh, what was happening in Norway and how those incentives uh, are fantastic in driving um, uh, customer consideration into electric cars and then exactly what's happened in Norway. And I think there's some examples uh, also in some of the Nordics where those things like in Denmark where um, incentives went away, maybe a little too soon, and you saw the market uh, market change uh, in a different way. And I think they're trying to now um, catch up to what Norway's done. But I think Norway is an example for the world. I think we have uh, pockets of that in the U.S. where we see areas in the U.S. that are certainly growing faster than others and driven by incentives. And as the vehicles get out in the market, more people can experience them. Uh, you know, it, it just it drives adoption. So uh, excited to talk more about that. Great, great insight. Uh, Amadine, I know you do a lot of work internationally as well. Um, can we get your reaction as well? Um, well, first of all, I, I you know, I, I have to say that the congressman's uh, pieces about Argon National Labs and the national labs that, uh, and their import in, uh, in the United States is, is, is just fantastic and, and really interesting and, and something that we really need and, and are very grateful for all the insights that Argon and MRAL and all of the national labs provide to us uh, for energy kinds of insights. Um, but thinking about kind of the infrastructure piece that the minister mentioned and, um, you know, the, the changes of building codes for new buildings, but also the incentives that there are for retrofits, um, I think it's something that we really need to touch on, that we need to think about um, the, train, the change in uh, mobility um, as a holistic approach. Um, he also touched on the fact that they've already electrified their heating and that they built hydrogen power or hydro powered um, electric plants. So thinking about the fact that this is a holistic change that we need to make and that there are many pieces that go into our transportation um, uh, questions here, I think it's really important and looking towards what Europe has done um, for public charging as well as for multi-unit dwelling charging is really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's a great point. Although our, the scope of this conversation today is largely on the consumer side with vehicles, there's certainly a lot of other things to consider. Let's stick with industry and then move over to Argon. Dan Ryan from Mazda, can we get your thoughts next? Uh, sure, thanks for having me. Um, 
I guess my comments are mostly directed on what the minister talked about. And, um, you know, there, I think what we saw was a couple of things. Um, first, the all in approach towards incentives, you need to give consumers a lot of different reasons and um, to, to try an EV or to get one, um, whether it's the incentives on purchase for sales tax, the tolls, the parking, there's just a lot of different carrots out there, which I think is great. And also it shows the commitment and the will of the government to sort of go all in on this and stick with it. Um, because as he said, they've been at this for quite a few years. So um, those are the approaches that we need in the US as well. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Well, Thomas, Argonne National Lab uh, and the researchers there have certainly received a lot of well-deserved praise uh, on their program. Would love to hear your reactions um, and your perspective from the research community. Absolutely, and um, first of th thanks to Congressman Foster. I think Argon doesn't need any more introduction after the very kind comments uh, he already made earlier. And um, Argon is certainly very well known for um, its better R&D, right? The battery chemistry in the Chevy Volt was developed at Argon as one example. I want to highlight also uh, the role we play in the vehicle grid integration side, right? I think it's equally important uh, to developing the electric vehicles to have them as a smart piece of what Emmadine mentioned, a holistic system of vehicle and grid. And that's an area that my team is especially focused on. We have um, what we call the Smart Energy Plaza, coincidentally used to be a gas station where we research this interaction between the vehicle and the grid. And uh, most importantly, try to minimize the impacts that fast vehicle charging could have on the grid, which I think is especially important. Thinking of the minister's comments for electrification and the heavy duty side, I think heavy duty fast charging could be a real concern if we don't do this in a, in a very well planned out way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lots of great points. Looking forward to diving into those um, as our uh, leader in our discussion. But first I'd, I'd like to talk about incentives and get this group's thoughts. Uh, I think the, the Nor uh, the climate minister of Norway provided an amazing overview of all the different programs that that um, his country has put in order to um, uh, get more people into electric cars with uh, obvious success. Um, there is a uh, everyone's talking about infrastructure uh, in Congress right now. There's there's significant action on the Senate side. So uh, for the benefit of our Capitol Hill um, uh, uh, audience. What is this group's thoughts about um, how, how we should structure programs um, here in the US um, if the goal is to um, encourage electrification of the transportation sector? I'd like to begin. Dustin, do you have, do you have a perspective on this? Yeah, I think certainly you can see in areas of the country where you can combine federal and state incentives, how that drives behavior of the, of the consumer and really drives the adoption of electric cars. So the, the more that we can educate the consumer on these credits, I think the better that will be uh, on, on adoption. The other thing is, I think it's important that we don't bifurcate the market uh, versus you know, uh, different vehicles that are going to come in. Of course, we're a global company at Volkswagen. We produce vehicles all over the world. Uh, now we're committed to building our uh, electric ID4 here in the US. That's our volume product. But we'll also have interesting products that could come from Europe as well. And um, I think it's important that those cars can also play an important role in, in electrifying the marketplace. Uh, so I think there's a lot to think about. Certainly credits drive it. The other thing is, I think customers uh, that are looking at an electric vehicle generally have, um, they don't have a lot of knowledge about how a, a tax credit works. So the more that we can simplify that process of applying credits to vehicles uh, or rebates, uh, I think the better. Sure, and this is Dan, um, I can jump in and certainly endorse what Dustin said, but also just to note that the Biden administration has, you know, aggressive goals on uh, climate change and electrification. And it's going to be important to have as much choice as possible for consumers and uh, doing anything to sort of limit, you know, what kind of vehicle or where it's made, which consumers oftentimes just don't know anyway, uh, isn't really going to help us achieve that goal. We need them to be able to 
pick an EV and no matter where it's from, they can get some kind of incentive for it. I think those are great points. Um, and we talked about incentives, we've, we've talked about incentives uh, for um, the cars themselves, but there's also a lot of important things related to incentivizing investment in this charging infrastructure. Does this group have, have thoughts on that? Um, perhaps uh, others from industry, Amadine, do you have a thought on that? Well, so it's it's a really interesting point is, is and kind of what we could go back to what the, um, the minister uh, from Norway uh, mentioned was the need to, you know, while we're having private industry do a lot and Dustin's uh, counterparts at Electrify America have, have done a lot um, to be able to expand the charging network and it's, it's really great to see some partnerships with Walmart and, and various different um, larger uh, places. Thinking about how the government can continue to um, add on to those investments, um, thinking about signage and markings so that um, people know where the charging stations are. Um, sometimes there's one right around the corner from you and you may not even be aware of it. Um, simply because the, the marking is there. So making it easy for consumers to make this just as ubiquitous as seeing the signage for a petrol or gasoline station um, to see that sign, oh, there's a charging station right there. Um, are easy ways sometimes over and above incentives to think about um, getting people to just even have it be available to them. Um, so that would be one of the things that I would first think about. And then um, it was interesting to hear him say that there's reduced parking rates um, and different things like that. Um, so there are other ways that maybe aren't just to build the chargers, but um, maybe reduce parking for somebody who's parking at a charging station um, and refueling their vehicle. Um, those may be other things that we should explore here in this country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's very helpful to know that the menu of options of carrots and sticks that um, policymakers uh, can consider um, as we're encouraging the adoption of these important technologies. But speaking of these technologies, I'd like to move from their importance in conversation about incentives and let's talk about the science. Um, I'm, I'm particularly curious to know um, this group's insight on how this technology has advanced um, in, in, especially during your tenure within government, uh, within industry, and also in, in um, research, um, Thomas, I'd love to hear from you first on this, on um, on the recent advancements of of this kind of technology, um, and um, perhaps your thoughts on what we can expect in the near term. Absolutely. Um, um, as you're all well aware, the the uh, range of electric vehicles is uh, rapidly increasing, and with that, there is an expectation that the charge times don't increase at the same rate. So we see a much larger number of uh, DC fast charges being deployed. Um, one important aspect uh, on on charging in general, I wanted to point out that I think is an important role where the national laboratories can contribute is in terms of interoperability and standards. I think it's of utmost importance that if you get a consumer to purchase an electric vehicle, their experience has to be seamless. The last thing you would want is for them to struggle with finding a station or, or some communication issues between station and vehicle. And I think that's a role where Argonne and other national labs can be um, critical partners to ensure that, that to the consumer, it is a seamless experience just as it was when they were driving gasoline powered vehicles. Um, Expanding on that for the medium and heavy duty side, there is um, a lot of discussion currently going on on standards for the charge couplers when we talk about the megawatt charging level. And um, there, I think the comments resonate with, with the, the, the minister made, where we even think beyond on-road transportation, construction equipment, mining, maybe aviation, maritime, right? The more standardized we can be here, uh, the easier uh, it is uh, to, to deploy these assets and take advantage of them for various applications. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in that space. Mm -hmm. Fascinating perspective from the research community. Um, I'd love to hear the industry perspective. Um, Dan, do you have any comments here? Yes, um, I've long said that vehicle electrification isn't a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And obviously 
we're getting much, much closer to that sort of big shift now than we've ever been. So, um, you know, the, the costs are down, you know, we, we've all thought you really kind of need parity of cost between electric and gas um, to really push the shift and we're getting much closer to that. So, um, you know, the, a lot of the signals are very positive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, any thoughts from Dustin or Amadine on this note before we move on? Um, well, to kind of go on Thomas's piece about inoperability, I think that that's something that is, uh, it, it goes along to, the, to my, my point about the ease of knowing where your charging station is, mm -hmm. is uh, you know, also being able to charge. Uh, there, there were some articles out uh, in Axios about someone who had purchased a mach -E and tried to drive it from Boston to New York just recently. And uh, every charging station that they went to along their route that was fast charger um, happened to be a Tesla fast charger. And that mm -hmm. doesn't range with the uh, Mach-E's. And so um, just making sure that wherever you go, it's kind of like a gas station. Uh, a BP and an Exxon and all of those are, you know, you can fill up anywhere and making sure that we can fill up our, 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 our vehicles in the same way um, is really important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's a great point. And, and actually, I, in, in preparing for this conversation, I recall that Dustin, you have uh, some great anecdotes in this space. Could we talk about range anxiety for a moment. Dustin, could you talk a little bit more about your background here and, and how things have changed? Yeah, as, as you mentioned earlier, I've been in this space, you know, working directly with consumers on electrification for many years. Uh, in 2010, I drove an electric car from California to Detroit, Michigan for the, uh, the International Auto Show there. And I drove uh, at that time what was a Tesla Roadster. Not a very comfortable ride for that long, but um, uh, at the time, there was no such thing as a DC fast charger. There was there were zero in the US. Um, and we stopped at KOA campgrounds along the way. The journey took a while. Uh, so we we were able to just charge like a, like a consumer charges at home now. And just in this last 10 years of time, the amount of infrastructure that's already grown uh, has, has been incredible. And actually this year, I, I sort of rekindled that trip, but did it a little bit different. I started in New York uh, and ended in Sacramento uh, the long way in the new VW ID4 and used the Electrify America network to charge along the way. Um, and I think, you know, it was really just to prove to, you know, people that are going to be, you know, considering uh, uh, an ID4 that this is possible and it's actually quite easy. And what was important to us in our go to market strategy was actually to include that with the car. So for the first three years, you have unlimited fast charging with the ID4. So it really takes away that barrier for customers and gets them to consider this because now you have the same capability that you have with a gas car and a much, you know, in a much it's an attractive uh, a price point because it's free. Um, so your fueling, if you're going to be DC fast charging, is is no cost. So really, in the focus that we took for our go to market strategy was to solve the price parity, which um, you know the ID4 starts at under forty thousand dollars. Get good capability; it has more than two hundred fifty miles of range, and to solve charging. And the charging piece was important, and so we decided to include that for the first three years for free. Sure, I, I guess I. It's interesting, the, the free charging is a great incentive, um, but I think it kind of brings out one of my questions of, around this is what is the business model for charging? Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, VW is not the only one that has done that as an incentive, but does that give the right um, market signals to new entrants to build charging stations? Because what's can they make money on them? And they talked about in Norway, how most of them are built by private industry. So that isn't just, isn't really solved yet in the US of, of how that's gonna work and the percentage of public investment in charging stations versus private. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, uh, especially that it does seem like a very transformative time for the industry. Um, I would like, we have time for one more question uh, before we have to wrap. 
Um, I, before and and I'll open it up for closing comments. But first, I do want to get this group's thoughts on the critical mineral supply chain. Um, I know that concerns exist uh, that a lot of mining may be needed to secure lithium and other materials to build some of the batteries that are used in, in cars. So want to know this group's thoughts. Do we have the capacity to make these batteries in the, in the US? Does it matter? What about recycling? Um, what, what, what is this group's thoughts? Maybe I'll, I'll go first. Um, Argon recently contributed uh, with an EV lithium ion battery report that's I think part of the national blueprint for lithium ion batteries. And Chrissy, you mentioned it. I think Recycling is one of the key topics uh, when we talk about um, vehicle electrification. And um, Argon, uh, I think a couple of years ago, started to resell um, a major recycling center. And um, the last point I want to make on recycling is I think recycling starts in the design phase of the vehicle, right? Anything in an electric vehicle has to be designed so that it can be reused or recycled. So recycling doesn't become this afterthought that we deal with when we have 10 year old electric cars. But the recycling really has to start when we design the vehicles to make uh, it economi economically viable to recover uh, the materials. And um, I know there's a lot of work on the way. Um, and I think that's probably uh, the most important consideration when, when, when designing new vehicles too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would just say that, um, you know, supply is certainly important. Um, but as much as there's talk about build it in America and buy America, um, we live in a global economy and, mm -hmm. um, you know, parts and components, whether it's these critical minerals or something else, they're all coming from all over the world. And I don't think that's going to, going to stop. I think that's an astute observation. Any thoughts from uh, Amadine or Dustin on this before we move to closing thoughts? Well, um, I would just say that I think the, the global community is really trying to come together on uh, answering this question of recycling. Uh, the UNECE um, is working on a global uh, uh, technical regulation about um, battery recycling and uh, working through that process. Um, from members all across the globe about how to address this and how to work on that. And I know the US EPA is very involved in that as well as um, some experts from Argonne and, and, and some of the other national labs. Um, and I think that making sure kind of to Dan's point that we, li we live in a globalized supply chain and making sure that those regulations are harmonized across the world so that we're working together to think about these big problems um, in, a, in a kind of harmonized manner. Uh, so that's what, that's what we would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, last point in that is I think we have a responsibility to, to lead in these areas. We're gonna be putting these products out in the marketplace. Uh, you know, in terms of battery recycling, uh, it's going to be down the road, given that the we're still in the infancy of many of these vehicles being on on the road, but uh, it's something that we have to be um, preparing for. We've already opened a battery recycling facility, Volkswagen has in Salzgitter, uh, Germany, uh, and we'll look to do those same things with partnerships in the U.S. as well as local production of battery, uh, battery production in the U.S. as well. Um, and, you, you know, as we look to produce these vehicles all over the world, you want to keep that supply chain close because mm -hmm. there's also uh, carbon emissions that go into, um, into production uh, of these vehicles as well. And you want to try to mitigate that as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, sadly, we have to wrap up our conversation soon, but I do want to uh, I know there's much that we didn't discuss, so let's do a quick round of closing thoughts uh, before uh, we, we end. Um, Thomas, do you, would you like to go first and then we'll go Dan, Dustin, Amadine? Sure, happy to. Um, maybe I'll close uh, similar to where I started and that's with the considerations around the entire ecosystem. Maybe the opportunity we didn't talk about, and Chrissy, absolutely, there's not enough time uh, to talk mm -hmm. about all these topics, is um, how can we monetize the battery assets um, on vehicles that are parked 97% of the time? Um, I think if we come to a, a, a workable solution for all stakeholders there, 
we could be coming up with something that just doesn't replace gasoline vehicles, but with a solution that's actually overall better. And I think mm -hmm. that should be the goal uh, to strive for. And um, there is some uh, encouraging announcements, uh, Volkswagen on their ID4, with allowing vehicle to create um, uh, energy flows. And I think that's a really important step in a good direction. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess it's my turn. Um, uh, you know, I think we're all excited about our uh, road towards the electrified future. Um, I think, as we saw from Norway, it really takes uh, a commitment that is deep and longstanding to get us there. Um, and we have to bring consumers along because, you know, everybody has a lot of plans around electrification. But EV sales, while they're growing, are still a very small part of the U.S. market. So it's going to be important that um, you know we work on that, and also, you know, from a practical standpoint, just acknowledge that the gas engine isn't going to go away overnight. Um, so we're just all going to have to work together on that transition. Mm -hmm. Dustin. All right. Yeah, my turn. So I think, um, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the panel. Really enjoyed it. Um, I, I think the, the big takeaway for me, and I think that we have uh, some examples of this, uh, you know, from Norway, is that it's very important to be mission focused. At Volkswagen, we are completely mission focused in making this a priority for our brands within the VW group. Uh, and the proof is in the products. We've got a lot of products that are coming out on the, on, in the marketplace. Uh, both on, uh, in terms of vehicles and then also what we're doing with Electrify America in terms of bringing interoperable charging uh, to all vehicles. So I think that you can see this as a mission on our side and we're trying to uh, accelerate this technology as quickly as possible because we need to. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to just uh, echo Dustin's thanks for having this panel. Thanks for having uh, an opportunity to talk about this. Um, I think that um, we've all pointed to the things that are really important in our commitment. Uh, Kia has a commitment through its Plan S of $25 billion investment in uh, global electric vehicle rollouts um, now for the end of the decade. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, operating costs for consumers, making this easy, making it um, easy to use, easy to uh, make that jump over to electrified vehicles and uh, make it make sense for them on their day-to-day -day life. So we want to not move choices and uh, make it easy to uh, uh, move along. So we look forward to um, ca uh, carrots, kind of like what uh, Norway has done. And uh, we, I think, are all mission-driven to uh, move this to a new future. Um, so thank you again for having us. Well, I think that's a, a great note to end on. Uh, th many thanks, Amadine, Dustin, Dan, Thomas, for being so generous with your time and insights. Many thanks to everyone tuning in this morning and thank you for your understanding us having us go a little long. Uh, we just had so much to cover and I, I certainly didn't wanna cut this conversation short. Uh, so I do encourage folks to reach out to our expert panelists or myself if you have any questions left unanswered. Many thanks, of course, to the Climate Minister of Norway for his keynote remarks and his insights. Thanks to Congressman Foster for his comments at the start of our program and for his leadership in advancing science in Congress. We'll continue our congressional briefing series after August recess, but please do not hesitate to reach out to ICCF in the meantime. We're at internationalconservation.org. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>